All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Daily Power Parsha. Today is Friday, June 3rd, and this is not only Friday, Erev Shabbos, but it's also Erev Erev, mm, kind of. It's just a day or two before Shavuot, which begins on Saturday night, the anniversary of the giving of the Torah at Sinai, 3,334 years ago. Certainly a very special weekend that we're going into. And by the way, with that being said, just for uh, scheduling details, we usually have DPP Monday through Friday. This Monday, of course, is day number two of the holiday. So no DPP on Monday. So we have um, DPP today, Shabbos, Sunday is Shavuos, Monday is Shavuos, and then Tuesday, hopefully. Yeah, Tuesday, we should pick it back up. All right, let's jump right in to the Torah reading, which is Bamidbar. The first reading, the first Torah portion of the Book of Numbers, and um, we discussed two days ago. We talked about the census of the Levites. You know, the Torah portion started off with the census of the Jewish people at large, counting all the tribes except for Levi, because the Levites were meant to be counted on their own. And the Torah says, God says, the Levites are appointed in special service in exchange. For the firstborn, the firstborn amongst the general Jewish populace, they were supposed to have been the chosen ones to serve in the Mishkan and the tabernacle. But because of the sin of the golden calf that they participated in, so they were um, essentially bounced from that uh, from that role, from that exclusive um, privilege. And it was given instead to the Levites because the whole Sheva Levi, the whole tribe of Levi did not participate in the sin of the golden calf. And so, essentially, it was one for the other, exchanging a firstborn for a Levite. So how many Levites were there from the age of one month and up? The total number was, we're going to go back to the, uh, the Torah's count. It was 12,000, I want to say 12,300. Let's see. Let's see, let's see. I'm sorry, not 12,000, 22,000. I believe it was 22,300, right? If we looked in Rashi, we did the count at the end of last, the last session we did together, right? Another 300, right? So the total was 22,300 Levites. The Torah, however, only counts them as 22,000. And as we explained, the reason is, and I know I'm scrolling a lot over here, the reason is because... Um, those 300 Levites were firstborns, and it wasn't not that they exempt themselves from redemption. They redeemed themselves. They didn't need to be redeemed through other means. So just, uh, just to clarify that, I feel like we ended off with that little bit of a, maybe an unclear statement. The firstborn were supposed to be the chosen ones for this job. Instead, the Levites took the job. Okay, so one for one, a Levite for a firstborn. But of the Levites, there were 300 Levites that themselves were firstborn, which means that they would, have, they would have served God anyway. In other words, as firstborn, they would have had the job. Now as Levites, they have the job, but they don't have to compensate for firstborn because they were firstborn. So they are essentially covering for themselves. It's kind of like you're working a job and you need someone to cover your shift. So the firstborn are covered by the Levites. These firstborn Levites, they cover themselves. They cover their own shift. I'm a firstborn. Firstborns can't do it anymore. I'm a Levite. I'll cover it. It's the same person. So 300 of the Levites were firstborn that cover themselves. Again, I hope that makes sense. The other Levites that were available to cover firstborns were 22,000. Again, 22,000. Hey, Sandrine. Hey. Nice to get you back on a DB. Good joy today. Yay. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> get you back. Love it. Glad to be back. Hello, everybody. Awesome. The song. Olya, Sarah. Yeah, we got we got the crew. So we're talking about the uh, the role of the Levites in the Mishkan. Every family, the Levites, there were three families: Gershon, Kahat, and Merari. Each one had their own job, their own their own role, their own their own place where they encamped. And the twenty and there were twenty two thousand three hundred Levites in total from. Three, from one month old and up. So from 30 days and up, there were 22,300 Levites. However, only 22,000 of them were covering for firstborn, were essentially replacing, replacing um, 
the, what the, the privilege that would have gone to the firstborn because 300 of the Levites themselves were firstborn. So as firstborns, they should have served God in the temple, in the Mishkan. But they're firstborn, and the firstborns lost it. But they're also Levites, so they covered it themselves. So therefore, that leaves 22,000. Now, this leaves us, this leads us, I'm sorry, into today's reading. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, I have a quick question. Maybe I missed yes. it. How, how we, like, we have to redeem the firstborn until these days, right? And do Levites, do they have to, like the tribes of Levites, do they have to do that too? So excellent question. The answer is no. Anyone from the tribe of Levi, in other words, any Kohen or Levi, if you're a Kohen or a Levi, sorry, if the, hold on. If the mother, give me a second here. If the, I have to remember if it's both parents that are Israelite, that are non Kohen or Levi, or just the mother is a non Kohen Levi. If she is a, if she is the daughter of a Levi, she's married to a, anyway. <laughs> I believe that if there's, uh, let's play it safe. If both the father and the mother are non Kohen, then, mm -hmm. or not, sorry, non Kohen or Levi, then you have to do the redemption. If they are, if she, either one of them, I think if okay. either one of them is a Kohen or Levi. Okay, so they don't have to, and the rest of their, us, I guess they would have to like do that today, redeem the firstborn. Yeah. So, okay. like my oldest son, Nassan. Yeah. So when he was 30 days old, we redeemed him. Um, we we mm -hmm. had, there was a ceremony. We brought him to a Kohen. I don't know. We didn't bring him to a Kohen. It's not like, hey, who's a Kohen? We, <laughs> we had a party. We called the Kohen in. We get, there's five coins that you give and you mm -hmm. give the coins and then exchange with the child. It's like a whole cool ceremony and, and ritual. We did that. It's a lot of fun. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. So that's still done until today. Um, essentially because the firstborn belonged to God. And although we don't have a temple and there's no, there's no service, but that mitzvah is the custom is still done to this day. All right. Which takes us to reading number six. Today, we're going to do reading six and seven for Friday and Shabbos. So let's buckle up and let's see what we got here. Numbers chapter three, verse number 40. The Lord said to Moses, after they counted the Levites and got 22,300, count every firstborn male aged one month and upward. You see what's going on here. Just like the Levites were counted from one month and up, so too now the firstborn are counted from one month and upward of the children of Israel. That's the general populace. And take the number of their names. And you shall take the Levites for me. I am the Lord. Okay, that's like a little broadcasting note you should take the levites for me i am the lord instead of all firstborns among the children of israel in other words take the levites instead of the firstborn and take the levites animals instead of all firstborn animals of the children of israel okay so basically we're going to do the great um switcheroo i don't know switcheroo it's like again like covering a shift it's like the levites will cover for the firstborn the animals for the firstborn animals so Moses counted every firstborn of Israel as the Lord had commanded him. How many did we get? The number, sorry, the firstborn males aged one month and upward, according to the number of names, was, look at this, look how close, 22,273. Look at that number, it's going to be very significant. 22,273. I'm going to put some numbers in the chat. Okay, let's hear if I don't know, hopefully you can see the chat. If not, it's also okay. I'll, I'll read everything. 22,300 was the total number of Levites. Okay, I just dropped that in the chat. 22,300. However, of those 22,300, 300 were Levite firstborn, which means that it's a wash because they were both Levites and firstborn, which means they can't cover for any other firstborn because they are the firstborn. So now that leaves you with 22,000, I know this is maybe a little tedious, minus 300, which equals 22,000, okay? There you go. So that leaves you 22,000 available non-firstborn Levites to cover for the firstborn amongst the general populace. But what we just read is that there were how many firstborn Israelites? 22,000, hold on, 22,200, 
and 73. Firstborn Israelites, i.e. non Shevet Levi, non Levi tribe. So now you have 22,000 Levites covering, right? So now you have 22,000. I'm going to call them uh, Levites that are available, okay? So you have 22,273 firstborn Israelites and 22,000 Levites that are available to cover those, which means now you have a deficit or an outstanding balance, as it were, of 273 non-replaced um, Israelites. Yeah, I don't know if this, I don't know if the typing makes it easier or harder for everybody to, to follow what's going on here. You have 22,000 Levites that are available to cover. Uh, but the problem is you have 22,273 firstborn, which means there are 273 uh, firstborn Israelites that are not covered by a Levite. What do you do with those guys? Uh, the Torah continues. The Torah continues with the info. Torah is very precise as to what should happen. Verse 44, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the Levites instead of all the firstborns among the children of Israel and the Levite animals instead of their, their animals and the Levites shall be mine. I am the Lord. Okay, that we know. All of this we've had multiple times. However, here's the new information. As for the 273 of the children of Israel who required redemption or in excess of the Levites, you only have 22,000 Levites to cover for 22,273 Israelites firstborn. That leaves 273 uncovered, unaccounted for. So what should you do? Here you go. You shall take for those 273, five shekels per head, according to the holy shekel, by which the shekel is 20 geras, i.e. use that holy shekel coin. Take five shekels per head. Each For each of the 273, take five shekels. You shall give the money to Aaron and his sons in redemption of the firstborns who are in excess of them. By the way, Oli asked before about the redemption of the firstborn. That's exactly what we do. We take five coins, we give it to the coin. Where's the first time this was done? Right here. Right here in this reading. We're reading about it. After they swapped a, a Levite for a firstborn, there were 273 extra firstborn. What do you do with them? Cash. Five shekels per head. That's how you redeem them. So the others were redeemed one for one, a person for a person. I mean, not really redeemed, but like their role was replaced by a Levite who did that role. What about the extra 273? They have to be redeemed through gelt, through shekels, five shekels per head. So Moses took the redemption money for those in excess of those redeemed by the Levites. He took the money from the firstborn of the children of Israel. I wonder how they knew who was the 273 that didn't get covered. Or they just raised the money from everyone. You understand my question? Like, did they, okay, did they line them up? Okay, you, like, like pair them up as like um, pen pals. It's like firstborn Levite. Okay, you guys go, you, you, and then you have 273 people left in the room. All right, you guys got to pay up. Or did they just collect it from everybody? They just all pitched in that whatever the total number of shekels were. I, I'm not sure, but maybe it's in the commentaries. So they took the money from the firstborn children of Israel. How many? 1,000. 365 of the holy shekels. Because if you do the math, I'm going to do the math right here. I have a calculator. So 273 times five shekels, 273 people times five shekels is exactly 1,365 coins. 1,365 shekels covered all of the unredeemed firstborn. Then Moses gave the money of those redeemed to, it goes to the coin, to Aaron and his sons, in accordance with the word of the Lord, as the Lord had commanded Moses. That's how it rolled. All right, let's do Rashi. Hope this makes sense. A very math-heavy reading. I don't know, very. Uh, somewhat math-leaning reading, but hopefully it works. Count every firstborn male, age one month and upward. Why one month? As we said before by the Levites, from, from the time he is no longer categorized as possibly a premature birth. Uh, from when the child is, is, is viable. After one month, we know the child's going to be healthy. That's the idea. Okay, and the Levite animals. Uh, 
The Levite animals did not redeem the clean firstborn animals, the Israelites. In other words, they still had to donate those to the Kohen or to the temple, but their firstborn donkeys, they covered their donkeys, the non-kosher animals. One lamb belonging to a Levite could exempt many firstborn donkeys of an Israelite. Just so you know. The proof is that scripture counts the excess number of firstborn men, but not the extra animals. The Torah doesn't start giving us a, an audit of how many donkeys the Levites had and how many firstborn donkeys there were, and then figuring out how to cover the remaining. It, it was covered. It was just considered to be a wash, whatever the number was. Um, as, as for the 273 of the children of Israel who require redemption, Rashi says, the firstborn among them who require redemption, these are the 273 in excess of the Levites. From them, ooh, from them, it sounds like from the 273 in excess, which sounds like they somehow figure that out. From them, you shall take five shekels, sorry, five shekels per head. Such was the, ooh, such was the sale price of Joseph, the firstborn of Rachel. For the price was 20 silver pieces, 20 dinarum, which equals a sella. Interesting. I'm sorry, 20 dinarum, four of which equal a sella. 20 dinar and four, which equals sell. 20 divided by four is five. A sella is a shekel. We had that before. A sella equals a shekel. So thus, Joseph, in fact, was sold for five shekels. That seems to be the going rate per head, as it were. Okay, in excess, Moses took redemption money for those in excess of those redeemed by the Levites. Those remaining after the Levites had redeemed them with their very selves. Right After the Levites said, okay, one for one, one for one, one for one, the remaining firstborn that didn't have a, Lev a, 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 a Levite, a Levi, to cover, was that two thousand? What uh, two seventy three? One thousand three hundred sixty five shekels. This is the sum total at five shekels per head. Rashi breaks it out. <laughs> no faith in us. Rashi literally breaks down the numbers. For two hundred firstborn, you get a thousand shekels. Rashi is making it. E Rashi, he's giving us easy math, right? Two hundred times five is a thousand. Great. What about because 273? So 200 is a thousand shekels. For 70, seven times 70 times three is 70 times three is 350 shekels. I don't know why I paused there, right? Seven times 30, sorry, 70 times. Isn't it 210? <laughs> no, I'm wrong. I'm 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 speaking. The reason why I'm unclear is because I'm saying the wrong number. Oh. I'm saying the wrong number from the beginning, not from the beginning. It's five coins. So 200 times five coins is 1,000. 70 times five coins, I, I would say three for some reason, because I saw 300. 70 times five coins is 350 shekels. And for three firstborn, because there's 273, three times five is 15, right? 15 shekels. So if you add 1,000 plus 70, I still can't do this. 1,000 plus 350 plus 15 is 1,365. Moses says, how shall I do it? If I tell a firstborn to give five shekels, oh, here we go. This was the question. How shall I do it, Moses said? If I tell a firstborn to give five shekels, he will tell me I am one of those redeemed by the Levites. What do you mean? I should pay up. I got a Levite buddy. I got a, I got a uh, pen pal. I got a big brother. What did he do? He brought 22,000 slips of paper. Oh, they did, they did a lottery. 22,000 slips of paper and wrote in them Levite. Then 20, then 273 slips and wrote in them five shekels. Oh, oh, oh look at that. They, there was literally a basket. There was a basket, a bowl, an urn with 22,273 slips of paper. 22,000 of which said Levi, Levite, Levi. The other 273 said five shekels. He jumbled them and put them into an urn and told them, come and take your slips according to, to, to Lot. According to the Goro, according to the Lot. Each one took a slip of paper. Either it said Levite, in which case you're good to go, or five shekels, in which case you paid up. That seems pretty fair. And then Moses gave that money to Aaron and his sons. Okay. Any questions so far? I love the little lottery situation going on there. Questions? Comments. All right, let's jump back in. By the way, at any time you can ask a question or comment. It doesn't have to be only now. All right, seventh reading. Reading seven. 
This will close out the Torah portion. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying. Okay, let me pause here. Before we counted the Levites from one month and upward. Why do we count the Levites from one month? Oh, we've got the whole the total number of viable Levites that will serve or, or are serving or eventually will, whatever it is, the, the, full, the full number, that was 22,300. Done. Now we're going to do another census. If you recall, each of the Levite families, there were three Levite families, Gershon, Kahat, and Merari. Because Levi, the original Levi, had three sons, Gershon, Kahat, and Merari. So within the, the tribe of, of Levi, there were three branches, almost. Like a family tree, boom, boom, boom. And each one of these three Levite families had their own job. Gershon carried the tapestries. Kahat carried the vessels. And Merari carried the beams, right? I mean, essentially, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying it, but Gershon, the first family, the oldest family, the oldest son, carry, that family carried um, the coverings, the curtains, the animal skins, like the textiles. Kahat carried, Kahat carried the menorah, the altar, the showbread table, like the vessels. And Merari carried the heavy sockets, the beams, the structure. But at what age did they do that? 30 to 50. A Levite in service was 30 years old to 50 years old. That's when the Levite, that's 20 year span that, that a Levite served in that capacity. Under 30, they were in training. Above 50, they were retired. I'm sure they still helped out, but not officially doing the job. 30 to 50. So now the Torah is going to do another census of the three Levite families, Gershon, Kahat, and Merari, to ascertain just how many of these Levites are ready to roll. How many are of working age as a Levite right now? That's, the, that's a new sense, census. So when it comes to the Levites, there's two different censuses. There's two different counts. You're counting all of the Levites, essentially, and then the ones of working age. This also leads into the fact, or also helps explain why this book is called the Book of Numbers. Because even in this week's Torah portion, the opening portion, we have a general census. We have a census of the Levites, two census of the Levites. We have a census of the firstborn. There's all these different counts that are going on, hence a lot of numbers. All right, back inside, reading Number seven, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. Make a count of the sons of, Ko of Kahat. So the order is a little bit different. Before we counted them in the birth order, Gershon, Kahat, Merari. Here, when counting their serviceable age, the order of the families is different. Certainly that is significant. Uh, maybe we'll get into it. Make a count for the sons of the sons of, of Kahat. From among the children of Levi by their families, according to their father's house, what age? We already counted them. No. This is from the age of 30 until the age of 50. All who enter the service to do the work in the tent of meeting. That was the age of service in the Mishkan, 30 to 50. Okay. What do they do? The following is the service of the sons of Kahat in the tent of meeting, the Holy of Holies. We already described that in general before they carried the vessels, but here we get into more detail. The camp is about to travel. Oh, we got to pack everything up. Aaron and his son shall come and take down the dividing screen. With it, they shall cover the ark of the testimony. The dividing screen was the screen in between the holy and the holy of holies. There was a curtain blocking the place where the ark, the holy ark was. They took that screen, that curtain, and they used it to cover the ark of the testimony. They shall place upon it a covering of tachash skin, and on top of that they shall spread a cloth of pure blue wool. Then they shall put its poles in place. They shall spread a cloth of blue wool on the show table, and they shall place it on the form, spoons, supports, and covering frames. The continual bread can then be placed upon it. So what's interesting here is all the vessels, before they were transported, were always covered. It's covered. Even today, when we 
transported Torah from one place to the other, we always cover it with, with another covering. They shall spread upon them a cloth of crimson wool and cover that with a covering of tachash skin, multiple layers of coverings. Then they shall put its poles into place. They shall take a blue cloth and cover the menorah for lighting in its lamps, its tongs and its scoops, and all its oil vessels used in, the perform in performing its service. They shall put it and its vessels into a covering of tachash skin. That's the uh, multicolored magical unicorn. And place it on a pole. They shall spread a cloth of blue wool over the golden altar and cover it with the covering of tachash skin and then set and then set its poles in place. They shall then take out, take all the vessels used in the holy, put them into a cloth of blue wool, cover them with the covering of tachash skin and put them onto a pole. They shall remove the ashes from the altar and spread a cloth of purple wool over it. Make sure you don't cover it while it's dirty. That's not going to be good. They shall place on it all the utensils with which they minister upon it, the scoops, the forks, the shovels, and the basins, all the implements of the altar. Then they shall spread over it a covering of tachash skin and set its poles into place. Aaron and his son shall finish, the, shall finish covering the holy and all the vessels of the holy. And the camp is set to travel. And following that, the sons of Kahat shall come to carry them. So Aaron and his sons, the Kohanim, they're the ones that do the covering of the vessels. They prepare it. They pack things up. I hope that's clear. They basically pack everything up. And then who does the moving? Who does the transporting? Who does the schlepping? I mean, in only a very respectful fashion, the sons of Kahat, the Kahat family, the Levite family of Kahat, they come to carry them. But they shall, listen to this, but they shall not touch the sacred objects. That's why they're covered. You can't touch the altar. If you're a non cohen you can't touch the altar. For then they will die. These are the burdens or the burdens. The load, the load of the sons of Kahat for the tent of meeting. This was their job. Amongst other things, they carried, when the Mishkan traveled, they carried the vessels. What, they just carried the ark? No, 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 it was covered. Who did the covering? Aaron and his sons, the priests, the high priest and the priests, they, they did the covering, they did the packing, they put on the shrink wrap, they put on the bubble wrap, and then the family of Kahat, they did the actual moving. The charge of Elazar, the son of Aaron, the Kohen. Oil for lighting. The incense of spices, the continuing daily meal offering, and the anointing oil, the charge for the entire Mishkan, and all that is in it, the holy and all its furnishings. Okay, so Lazar had those jobs. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Do not cause the tribe of the families of Kahat to be cut off from among the Levites. In other words, don't play with their lives. Do this for them so that they should live and not die. When they come approach the holies, the holy of holies, Aaron and his son shall first come and appoint each man individually to his task and to his load. They shall not come in to see when the holy vessels are being wrapped up, lest they die. In other words, you guys have to make sure that everything is prepped and wrapped up and covered by the time the Levites of Kahat, the Kahat family comes in to transport it. Aaron and your sons, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest and the priest, you guys have to prep it before, and otherwise you're putting their lives at risk. If they come and see it just exposed, unwrapped, and in essence irreverent, not really irreverent, but like just exposed, then it's not, uh, it's not a good thing. By the way, that is how the Torah portion ends. Lest they die. Vamesu, lest they die. It's got to be wrapped up and prepped. All right, let's look at Rashi. On this reading, so a new census at the beginning of the reading, make a count. Rashi says, count those among them who are fit for the service of caring and are from the age of 30 until the age of 50. One under 30 has not reached the peak of his strength. From this, our sage is said at 30 for full strength. And over 50, one's strength begins to wane. So you had that window between 30 and 50 to really to really do schlepping, to really move and transport. Under 30, you're not yet fully strong in, in a mature way. Over 50, it's already declining. 
20 good years of transporting uh, age. The Holy of Holies, the holiest of all, the ark, the table, the menorah, the altars, the divine curtain, and the service utensils. Aaron and his son shall come. They shall put each vessel into its holder. Specify for it in this section. Right? Every vessel had its wrapping, its container. Not container, but like its covering. The Levites, sons of Kahat, need only carry them. Remember, Aaron and his sons, they do the covering. And Kahat only does the carrying. They don't wrap it. When the camp is about to travel, and the cloud withdraws, they know they're about to travel. It's tongs, a type of tweezers with which the wick was drawn to the desired direction. When it comes to the menorah, they had a tongue, like a tweezers, a large tweezers where they would, you know, be able to pick up the wick. You know, when you use an oil lamp, the wick can slip down, whatever, you put the wick, move it around. It scoops a small spoon with a level bottom, not rounded. It was used to rake the ashes from the menorah lamps when he cleans them. The lamps in which the oil and wicks are placed. Tachash skin, a type of large sack that was used to cover the menorah in this case. All the vessels used in the holy, that is within the Mishkan as opposed to the Koryo, which is holy. These are the incense vessels with which they ministered on the inner altar. You shall remove the ashes from the copper altar, that's the outer altar. They shall remove the ash from upon the altar and spread a purple cloth over it. The fire that descended from heaven crouched under the cloth like a lion during their travels. It's unbelievable. We know that when the Mishkan was, uh, was operating, there was a fire that was created by human beings. We put, put wood in, and created fire. And then there was a fire that descended from above. So obviously, when you're going to transport the altar, you're not going to have a fire burning on it. You, you extinguish the fire. But what about the heavenly fire? Rashi says, the fire that descended from heaven was still there. Even when they moved it, even when it was covered, it crouched under the cloth like a lion during their travels. But it did not burn it because they covered it with a large copper pot. Unbelievable. They put a copper lid, like, an like a copper, a pot is a weird, I mean, it's like, I don't know, like, a, I guess like a pot, but like a large covering that had space for that fire to stay. And then they covered it with the cloth. Scoops, scoops they used to rake the coals. Forks to prod the limber, the, the limbs on the altar. Huh, not limber, timber. To prod the limbs on the altar, right? When you have a fire, you poke it, psh, the fire goes. Um, and to turn them over so that they would be consumed properly and quickly. Shovels to sweep the ashes off the altar. Okay, the covering of the holy of the ark and the altar. Vessels of the holy menorah and the service utensils. If they don't, if they're not, uh, if they're not covered before the Kahat family gets there, they will die. If they touch the sacred objects, they are punishable by death at the hands of heaven. You cannot touch the altar. It's not a thing. Um, the charge of a lazar who was assigned to carry them, the oil, the incense, and the anointing oil. I thought I thought that the altar was carried with those poles. And then and then you're saying that there's this like dome covering over the top? A metal yes. gold. Yeah, okay. They used, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is all, all of the above is correct. Yes. They used the poles. The poles, remember, the poles extended out from the body of the ark and the altar and the menorah. There was there was the, these poles that extended out. So the poles they still put on their shoulders, but the actual item itself was covered in a cloth. When it came to the altar, there was a heavenly fire. What happened? Like that pulled back? No, it stayed. It crouched down. It stayed. They covered it with like another copper lid. I'm trying to, oh, look what I have here randomly. Anyway, I have an aluminum pan. I don't know if it's clean. So I'm not going to turn it over. But imagine if you took, it's now over my head. Imagine if you took the aluminum pan, right, and just put it down on something. And the fire is now like, 
Anyway, the okay, fire yeah. Was, yeah, the fire was just underneath and just uh, hanging out. Okay, back inside. So Elazar, the son of Aaron, he carried the oil. He was in charge of making sure that the oil, the incense and the anointing oil went with them when they traveled. Who's got the oil? Aye, we left it. All right. So he was in charge of that and the continual daily meal offering. His duty was to issue orders to urge the other workers that it be sacrificed at the time of their encampment. Okay, so he was making sure that that got brought every day. And he was in charge of, for the entire Mishkan. He was also appointed over the load assigned to the children of God to direct each man as to his task and burden. He was the master of ceremonies. And this is what the verse means when it says the Mishkan and all that is in it, all the items mentioned above in this section. But the burden of the sons of Gershon and Merari, which did not consist of the Holy of Holies, was by order of Itamar as written in the portion of us. So that's next week. All right, we'll leave that. By the way, the reason why Kahat goes first, we just answered. Again, in the original account of the Levites was to the birth order, Gershon, Kahat, Merari. Here now we're in the 30 to 50, that's one month and up. Now 30 to 50 in the service count, Kahat goes first. Why? Because their job included the Ark. I mean, like they were involved with the holiest items. The curtains were, you know, very important and the beams were critically important, obviously. The structure was important and the coverings were important. But the actual Ark of, t- of the testimony, the actual altar, both altars, the menorah, that's like the, the holiest, those are the holiest items. And thus they are mentioned and enumerated first in the context of who was in charge of carrying them. Um, do not cause them to die. In other words, make sure they don't see it. They shall not come up, come in to see when the holy vessels are being wrapped up in their covering, as I explained above in this section. They shall spread such and such a cloth over it and cover it with such and such a cover. The wrapping of it mentioned here is identical with the covering mentioned above. Essentially, Rashi is saying, we already talked about this, but the point is that the Kahat family who comes in to move this stuff is not to be involved in the wrapping of this stuff and to see it in the process of being wrapped. It is considered to be I don't know, I'm going to add my own words, a bit immodest, as it were, or just not appropriate for them to see it in that state of being wrapped up. Once it's finished, once it's covered, then they can see it. All right, that is how we end. And I want to share just a very quick idea on this. That is that we encounter here at the end of the Torah portion, not only the law, the, the protocol of how the Mishkan was transported through the wilderness, although certainly that's what we just read, but we also encounter a notion of what to do when something is holy and sacred. When something is holy and sacred, right, we wrap it up. What does that mean? We respect its modesty and its dignity. That's why a Torah scroll is not flaunted without a cover. When you carry, when you transport the Torah scroll through the synagogue on the way to being read, you always do so covered. You always do so covered. And I know that there is a tradition in some synagogues on some holidays, including uh, uh, Simchat Torah, to unroll the whole Torah around the synagogue. You unroll it, and everyone holds a piece of it, and you see the whole Torah. And it's supposed to give everyone a sense of how big the Torah is. Traditionally, we would say that that might be a bit immodest. We would have to ask, we would have to ask a question, is that appropriate? Torah scroll, like the ark, and like the altar, and like the menorah, Torah scroll is sacred. And when something is sacred, you keep it covered. Unless you're using it, unless you're at this point reading from the Torah or, you know, the, the ark is set up behind curtains, but it's, you know, being used or it's, it's serving its function or the menorah is serving its function, then it's uncovered. But otherwise, when you're transporting it, you're moving it around, it is not exposed. And it's a reminder for us also vis-a-vis human modesty, personal modesty. And that is that Torah always encourages us to be a bit more modest in our lives. And I'm not just referring to what we wear. I'm referring to just a mindset. We live in a world where, where um, everything is shared, where there's, for many people, there's no such thing as boundaries or borders or closed doors or walls that keep things out. But in truth, human beings need that space. Our souls need that space. And if something is truly sacred, then it belongs behind a cover. That's just the way it is. The most sacred parts of our lives, our sacred relationships, our deepest relationships, 
um, the deepest part of parts of self. Not to say that we shouldn't get in touch with it and we shouldn't, and we live in a world where everything is out there and vulnerability, and that's good, but we have to also make sure that we're not crossing lines that are, are unhealthy. We put everything out there and we keep nothing for ourselves. That's also not necessarily healthy. So just a, just a reminder, when we read this section about the, the, uh, the covering of the Mishkan items before they're transported, before they're put out there into the world that's covered, let's remind ourselves about um, the Jewish value of modesty. It was Balaam, the evil prophet, who commented, Matovu Ohalecha Yaakov, Mishkan Asechi Yisrael, how good are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. He commented how good was the encampment of the Jewish people. Why? What was, what was the catalyst for that comment? He saw the Jewish tents stagger. The opening of one did not correspond to the opening of the other. They were intentionally staggered, one tent from the other. Why? So that no one should look into the window, window, into the tent opening of his fellow or her fellow. Because it would, it would be immodest. You have to give people space. You have to give yourself space and give people space. It's good to have space, even in a very close relationship, even in a very intimate relationship. It's good for everyone to maintain a little bit of space. It's good. Chesed is good. Gvura is also good. It's also necessary. I once heard a definition of love. I heard this from Ma Rabbi Manus Friedman. He said, love is a feeling of closeness and the desire and yearning to get closer. What's implicit in that definition is that there's somewhere that there's a gap that still needs to be bridged. If two parties feel like there's, they can't get any closer, at that point, they start drifting apart. As long as there's no mystery, as long as there's no somewhat of a space to try to, you know, to try to bridge, as long as there's not that space, you take the excitement out. The excitement of a relationship lies in the, the yearning, the desire to bridge a gap. If there's, no, if there's no gap to bridge, then things can become boring. So this is just some ideas, very quick ideas about, you know, human advice, personal advice, relationship advice, social media advice from the end of this week's Torah portion. Let's remember the value of covering things, the most sacred things creating a little bit of a partition, a little bit of a barrier, a little bit of a cover to keep it sacred, to keep it holy. All right. Um, I hope that I hope that, that you enjoyed today and this week and all the learning that we've done on this Torah portion. Thanks for joining. And uh, Olia and Sarah, thanks for uh, being part of the, of the week. Sandrine, I know you're following on the recordings. I hope I'm getting... Uh, I yes. know I'm not really getting them up in a timely matter, but a great hopefully, job. It's, no, hopefully no, it's not no. too untimely. I, I could cut up this week, yeah. Okay, good. Perfect. So, Thank um, you. And, th and thanks for being here in person when you are able to make it today. And yeah, uh, I wish everybody... Yeah, summer maybe I will be... See that? See that? Well, you never know. Mm -hmm. I know with school administration, summer is not a summer. <laughs> I, I know that uh, I know that firsthand. You know, there's always... The, oh, summer is when actually all the good things happen. Because once the year starts, you know... Whatever you did is that's how it's going to go. If you want to really do new things and exciting things, that has to be planned in the summer. But be that as it may, whenever you can join, we'd love to have you. Um, and, and I want to wish everybody really a good Shabbos and a good Yom Tif. Shavuos is really special. It's Zman Matan Torah Senu. It's the time. It's the festival of the giving of our Torah. It's the, time, it's the day that we got the Torah, which is everything. I mean, our identity as a people. As a nation, it all goes back to Torah. We are nothing without the Torah. Without the Torah, I don't know, we would have just, you know, been absorbed into whatever nation we were in and just been, I don't know, <laughs> Roman, Greek, Persian, nothing wrong with that. But there wouldn't be Judaism without Torah, obviously. Torah is what gives us our identity, is what has held us throughout all these years, all these centuries and millennia of Jewish life, of Jewish history. And so this weekend is a very special celebration. If you can, make sure to get to a synagogue on Sunday morning to hear the Ten Commandments. Very special mitzvah. Saturday night, we proceed that Saturday night by Torah, with Torah study. Join us Saturday night for Torah Talks. 
Sandrine will be presenting. So join us for, for that. We have four great topics, four great presenters, and an evening of fun and excitement and gourmet cheesecake. It doesn't get any better than that. So that's Saturday night, Sunday, Ten Commandments, followed by a gourmet deluxe dairy brunch. And uh, what else do we have? Yeah. And then the, and then the holiday also goes to, to Monday. Monday is Yiskar. So stay on and join us for that as well. All right. Tuesday, we'll pick up DPP. And uh, we'll pick it up on the other side. All right. Happy holiday. Happy holiday. Is that what we say? Chag Shavuot Sameach. And I wish you the traditional Hasidic blessing. Kabbalah Satora Besimcha Obeprimius. May you receive the Torah with joy and in an inner fashion, integrated with your very essence. All right. Good Shabbos. Good Yom Tev. Good Shabbos. Good, good Yom Tev. Everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.